let's continue. Welcome to the study of Matthew chapter six. This is part two. So last week, by the grace of God, we started to look at this chapter. Um, we looked at length about our motives for the things that we do. Um, whatever it is that you are doing for the Lord or within the context of the body of Christ, it is important that we actually assess our motives, whether our motives are God-centered or whether they are self-centered. And so last week we spoke at length about that based on the verses one to five that we read. We talked about how perhaps when we give, you know, what is our motive for giving? Um, when you give to the poor, is it because you want to be admired? Is it because you want other people to know about it? We talked about how every time we do something, it's really about the motive of pleasing the Lord. That is what God is looking for. He's not looking for what we've done, but he's looking for the motivation behind what we're doing. So tonight, as we go into part two, we're going to be starting from verse five of Matthew chapter six. And I'll just go ahead and read it. So this is the New King James Version. And the words are read to remind us that these are quotations from the teachings of Jesus Christ, our Messiah himself. So Matthew 6 um, from verse 5. The Lord Jesus was teaching about prayer. And he said, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask. So let's just look at um, the review of these words. So Jesus is talking about prayer. Um, when we look at that word prayer um, in the original Greek, it's a word that means that we are actually coming into a direct approach to God. We are seeking his face. It's a term that is used where you're presenting a request, you are presenting uh, a vow, you are consecrating yourself, it conveys the sense that we are immediately before the throne of God. And so if you understand that when you are praying, you are bringing yourself before the throne of God, the first thing that you're going to do is to worship him, is to adore him, is to honor him. And so the Bible is clear here that when we pray, we must not see it as kind of like um, a tick box activity or something that is very far from the presence of God, something that is far removed from God. But when we pray, we are literally bringing ourselves before God's presence. And so when we are bringing our prayers, whether it's confession, it's petition, it's intercession, it's praise, it's thanksgiving, all that we must do it with the understanding that we've actually come before God. We are not speaking to thin air. We are not just standing there um, to fulfill an obligation, but we've literally come before God. And then the Lord Jesus said, when you stand praying, so that talks about posture. So what posture should we adopt in the place of prayer? How do we pray? What's the posture? What's the correct way? Now, the Bible actually gives us many different postures that are associated with prayer. One of them is to prostrate, to completely lie flat down. And you can see that in Numbers 16, 22, Joshua 5, 14, uh, Matthew 26, 39, and even in Revelation, where people completely flat out, lie down on their face and they prostrate before the almighty God. You could actually adopt the posture of kneeling. And again, there are scripture references here that we could use where we see in the word of God, people kneeling before God. You could actually pray sitting. So the fact that you are physically sitting on a chair doesn't mean that you know your prayer is not acceptable because it's not really about the physical um, posture. It's about the internal posture, the position of your heart, 
the position of your mind and your focus. And again, you could be standing as the Lord Jesus mentioned here. So our posture, our outside external posture is not really the main thing. What's the main thing is what's going on on the inside. So where should we pray? In this context of the scripture that I've just read out to you, Jesus was saying, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets so that they may be seen by men. So Jesus was pointing out that these people, and he was referring to the religious leaders of the time, so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them, that when they prayed, they didn't want to be in a place where there was no audience they would prefer to pray in the synagogue where everybody would see them or stand by the corners of the streets. So for us today, in our modern day world, we would wonder why were they praying by the corners of the street or was it that they were doing a prayer walk or something similar? But actually in the times when the Lord Jesus was teaching this, praying by street corners was quite a normal, um, it was a normal activity because what happened was the devout Jews, they would stop at the appointed hour of prayer. So let's say they were walking down the street or they were by the corner shop or somewhere. If the hour of prayer started, they would stop whatever they were doing at that very place and then they would start to pray. The appointed hours of prayer were at nine in the morning, um, noon, midday, and three o'clock in the afternoon. So when you think about it, if you were indeed a hypocrite and you wanted to have an audience when you were praying so people could admire how very well you prayed, if you were a hypocrite, these were actually perfect times for getting an audience, you know, if, you, if it was nine o'clock in the morning, noon, day, three, three in the afternoon, these were times where the streets would obviously be full of people. And what some Bible scholars say is that the word that is being used for street in the Greek version of the New Testament is actually the word that refers to a wide street. So the Lord Jesus was saying, these hypocrites were actually targeting the busy um, streets, the, the wide roads where many people would be at and they would actually plan, they would make it look like a coincidence, but they would be planning, actually they were planning to be in that place where there were a lot of people at the hour of prayer. It wasn't as if they were being caught unawares, maybe because they were in the middle of doing something, but what the scripture is saying, it's like these people would purposely position themselves at that place so that the hour of prayer would meet them at a place where there would be many people who would then be impressed maybe by their eloquence in the place of prayer or their knowledge of scriptures um, and their knowledge of, you know, religious terminology. So Jesus says, don't be like that. Instead, when you pray, go and shut yourself in a closet somewhere. Go into your room, shut the door. Your prayer, the focus should be about your father. It shouldn't be about the audience that is listening. Now, Jesus is not saying to us, that praying in public is not to be done. So that's, that wasn't his point. So that doesn't mean that you've got to stop going for prayer walks or um, praying within um, a local church assembly. Jesus himself did pray in public. And we can see that in, in, in Matthew 14, 19, in Matthew 15, 36, that he did pray publicly. But when he was saying pray in secret, he was saying, look, the focus of your prayer should be your father. And if being in public is going to distract you or cause you to start acting up because you want people to be impressed with you, go and keep yourself away from people. In fact, the more you do it in private, the better, because you are more able to focus on your father and you're able to turn your heart towards him and not on other distractions. And then... You know, when, when you look at it, again, it's coming back to the motives that we spoke about last week, that what is our motive for prayer? If our motive for prayer is to come into kononia, into fellowship with God, then obviously we would want to limit the distractions as much as we could. One other thing that the Lord is saying here is that um, when we come into the place of prayer, because we are speaking to our heavenly father, 
any prayer that we pray without actually acknowledging the presence of God is a waste of time. So we, we, we never should be those people who come into that position where you are even saying one word of prayer without having a conscious revelation, a conscious understanding that you have come into the presence of God and that you are actually praying to him. If you're not conscious that God is there, God is with you, it's him you are praying to, then automatically that prayer is a waste of time. Our prayer is wasted if we are not acknowledging God. We are not conscious that he's there with us and that it's him that we are, we are speaking to. So, you know, we should never even utter one syllable of prayer, whether in, in, in a public gathering or in private, until we are conscious that we've come into his presence. Because sometimes there's this temptation to pray absent-mindedly and to begin to, um, you know, think that you can just do it by experience or whatever. Your mind is not engaged. Your, your soul is not engaged. Your spirit is not engaged. You are not conscious of the presence of God. We cannot be praying like that. Every time we pray, we must have that revelation that my father is here and it's God that I'm addressing because he's omnipresent and he's omniscient. So Jesus said the people who were praying in the streets were hypocrites. So what's a hypocrite? So a hypocrite is that man or that woman who puts on a mask and pretends to be what they are not. So it means that the person is insincere. They are pretending to be pious or they're pretending to be virtuous, but they are not. They are more important. They are, sorry, they are more focused on what's going on on the outside rather than what's going on on the inside. So when we are being hypocrites, it means that we are more focused on our reputation. We are more bothered about what people think about us, what the reputation we have. Whereas God is more concerned about our inside, which is our character, you know, is concerned about what's going on in our heart. He's interested in our character, not our reputation. So we could very well have a very good reputation with human beings. People could be very impressed about us. People could think that we're marvelous, we're brilliant, we're very spiritual. But if God is not impressed with us, the the respect of human beings will not actually answer our prayer. The respect of human beings will not actually give us anything tangible, really, in terms of spiritual mileage. So, you know, it's a thought that we need to ask ourselves tonight. Who do I seek to please in all the, you know, the religious activities that I'm involved in, whether it's turning up to a local church assembly gathering, turning up for Bible study, um, singing in the choir, being an usher in church, ch teaching children's church, whatever it is that we're doing or being teachers of the word. Whom are we seeking to please? Are we seeking to please God the Father? Or are we seeking to have a good reputation and to please the people around us? Are we actually our authentic selves in whatever it is that we're doing for the Lord? Are we coming in authentically as exactly what God has created us to be, as what we've been ordained to be? Are we actually living the same life in secret as outside? You know, is our secret life, our home life matching up to the image that people have of us outside? Or are we like playing a part like actors and actresses? Are we, or are we seeking to please Father? And so, you know, that question is very important for us in everything that we're doing. Am I just pretending? Am I acting? Or am I seeking to please God? The daily devotional, our daily bread, you know, actually raises also another question about hypocrisy. Often we think that hypocrites are the people pretending in church or who say this and they're actually doing another thing. But this devotional says, you know what? The biggest hypocrites are those people who even refuse to come to Christ. They refuse to come to church. They refuse to pray. And they say, I'm not joining the prayer meeting. 
I'm not joining the prayer line because all of them on the prayer line are hypocrites. I'm not coming to church. Everybody there is a hypocrite. And what this devotional was saying is that, look, if you're not going to church, you're not joining any local assembly because according to you, everyone's a hypocrite. If you are doing that, actually you are the hypocrite because where you go, maybe to Tesco's or Asda's or Sainsbury's, wherever you do your shopping, there'll be hypocrites in Sainsbury's and Asda's and Tesco's, but that's not stopped you from going shopping. You know, where, where you work, there are hypocrites there, obviously, but it's not stopped you going to work. There are many places that you've been going and you've been interacting with people there and there are hypocrites there you've not stopped going. So one thing to remember, hell is full of hypocrites. So if you don't want to go to hell, it's good to actually come together with other believers. The Bible says we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves. We should stop pretending, you know, what is the real reason that we come up with these things and we look down on other Christians or we call them names. We should be actually looking more inwardly rather than pointing fingers at others. So this thing about hypocrisy is not as if the hypocrites are all those people over there somewhere. Actually, every single one of us has got to assess themselves and ask Holy Spirit to examine us for any signs of hypocrisy before we start, we start you know, pointing fingers at other people. So coming back to prayer, the Lord Jesus said, your father who sees you in secret when you are praying in that secret place in your closet, that he will reward you openly. Why? Because the Bible tells us, for example, in Proverbs 15, 3, that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. They are everywhere. There is no way you could be and you were raising a prayer and God was not aware of your prayer. If that was a sincere prayer, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. And it says that Jesus said that Father who sees what we're doing in secret will reward us openly. So there's no need to advertise the prayer because God will advertise the testimony. The testimony will be open. It will be for everybody to see. And we will get a reward. When God, the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching this and saying, God will reward you. He was saying, God will pay you back. He will give you back. In other words, it means that God has this obligation and responsibility to respond to your genuine, you know, heartfelt, spirit-filled prayers that are prayed in the name of Jesus. So God has this obligation to answer the prayer, to fulfill his promises. When we stand upon his word and we are praying in agreement with his will and we're praying in line with his word, God is obligated to answer us. And so Jesus says, your father will reward you. There is a reward for actually praying in the right way. And then, you know, some people will say, oh, you know, when you serve God, never expect anything in return, you know, just serve God because you love him. But actually, you know, the truth is that God is fine with us seeking to get a reward from him. Uh, because he said that he will reward us. You know, Christ says, yes, it's okay. Come and pray and your father will reward you. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven six 6, that whosoever comes to God must believe that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When we diligently seek God, he will reward us. So if you make up your mind that, look, I'm looking for a reward from God, you start to diligently seek God and God will reward you because that's what he does. And then the Lord Jesus said, when we pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Some people use that phrase, vain repetitions, to um, argue against praying in tongues, but that's not what Jesus was referring to here. By vain repetition, he was meaning empty, useless phrases. When we pray in tongues, it's not an empty, useless phrase. It's an, it's an utterance that has been given by the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit can also give the interpretation. 
So it's not a vain, useless um, repetition because it's the language of the Holy Spirit. However, what the Lord was meaning here is that for many people who maybe were born um, outside Christian families or maybe who've practiced other um, religions or other persuasions or spiritism, you will know that um, a lot of such religions, they have some phrases or incantations that people may be asked to repeat over and over and over and over until they tap into the power of whatever deity that they are submitting themselves to. So it might be the same thing, you know, over and over and they can do like prayer wheels or they can do prayer beads and they are repeating the same thing over and over and over and over. And what the Lord is saying is we, we can't do that. We can't be praying like that where it's almost like an incantation and you've just got a, an empty phrase that is not based on anything, don't mean anything and you keep repeating it. Jesus says, you don't have to pray long prayers for God to answer you. He says, your father knows the things that you need before you ask him. So with our prayers, it's about quality, not quantity. It's about the truth of God, not the length. Are we standing on the word of God? The famous preacher, um, Charles Spurgeon said, you know, it's not very easy to repeat the same words often without it becoming a vain repetition. So repetition itself is not forbidden, but a vain repetition is. So you could repeat a prayer. That doesn't mean that uh, God's not going to hear you. Um, that's not what the Lord Jesus was talking about. It becomes vain where you're just saying it over and over and over. It's not even registering, even in your own spirit. It means nothing to you. You are just repeating a phrase because you believe that that phrase is going to give you some spiritual mileage. So when we pray, it's about pouring our heart to God, engaging every single part of us with all sincerity, not vain repetitions. So the Lord Jesus then um, began to, to teach. So how do we pray? He said, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You will notice that the Bible says in this manner, therefore, doesn't say pray like this says in this manner, which means follow this pattern. It's a pattern. It doesn't mean that you stand every day reciting this prayer word for word without any words being moved out of place or whatever. That's not what the Lord was saying. He was giving us a template. Approach the Father. Pray addressing the Father, our Father in heaven. Understand that you are in a relationship with him. He is your father. You have been adopted into the family of God by reason of your faith in Christ Jesus. Your faith in the finished work of the cross has brought you into relationship with the father. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Bible says as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So you are a child of God. And when you start to pray, address your prayer to your father. And then as you come into the presence of your father, you honor him. Hallowed be your name. To be hallowed means to be set apart as holy, to be sanctified, to understand that you are approaching a holy father. You're not just coming to any odd place. You're coming to the presence of the most holy God, the one who sits enthroned forever. You hallow his name. You don't take his name in vain. You, you don't just stand there repeating his name without understanding, without respect, without honor. You don't dishonor him. Hallowed be your name. And then your kingdom come. You are actually asking God that the way that it operates in heaven, let it operate on the earth. So we belong to a kingdom. When Jesus was on the planet earth preaching and ministering, he never said to any one of us, um, Come, for Christianity is at hand. Come and join a church. No, he talked about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. He talked about the kingdom. 
So the day we give our lives to Christ and we come into the family of God, we've actually come into a kingdom. There is a structure to the kingdom with the king of kings and us, his children. He has called us kings and priests. And there is a, a way and a manner that we're expected to conduct ourselves in the kingdom. When we say your kingdom come, we are in agreement with how God wants things to work. We're in agreement with how the kingdom of heaven functions. It's a kingdom that is based on love and is based on righteousness and truth. And all the word of God, what the word has told us, that is the constitution of the kingdom. And understanding that, you then submit your will to the Father. You submit your will to the propagation of the gospel to the kingdom. You're saying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, the angels, the, the, the supernatural beings around the throne of God, they submit totally to the will of God. Bible tells us, you know, praise him, you, his angels, who hearken unto the voice of his word. So God is surrounded by beings that obey him, that submit to his will. You know, there are no beings in heaven who are doing their own thing. So when we say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are saying, Lord, we also want to surrender our will. We don't want it to be about our agenda, but we want your agenda. And then it goes on to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I'll come back to that in the slides to follow. And it says, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, this verse doesn't mean that God leads us into temptation doesn't mean that God is the one going to tempt us but it simply acknowledges that every day we get up in the morning we need the guidance of God and when we ask God to guide us we are asking God to guide us in such a way that whatever trials and temptations come our way on that day there are trials and temptations that by the grace of God we can overcome we are asking God not to allow us to be tempted beyond what we could bear. We are asking God to direct our footsteps so that we are not actually entering into the traps of the enemy. Deliver us from the evil one. And we know that, you know, we have an enemy, a permanent enemy, an enemy that is unrepentant, an enemy that can never relent, that can never change. We have an adversary, we have Hashatan, the Satan. So, we are asking God to deliver us from the activities of the adversary of the Satan because he has never given up his assignments against us. But by the grace of God and by the power of God, we can be delivered from all his schemes. And then he says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I think we all get that, you know. So coming back to this prayer. This prayer is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer, but we know that Jesus never actually prayed it himself. So rather than calling it the Lord's Prayer, you know, I submit to the view that we call it the disciples prayer. It's, it's the prayer of the disciple. And this prayer is like the template of prayer. It doesn't mean that you recite it word for word. Um, and also the Lord Jesus did not intend for us to be repeating this prayer like a, a ritual, just being ritualistic, just being repetitive and not actually engaging our spirit in it or our heart in it. This is a guide. It's a model for our prayers. Now, we know that even though Jesus has given it as a guide, that sadly, some people are using it to do vain repetitions. Now, we have to guard against that. This, this, this prayer is not about us just, you know, reciting it like we were taught it in primary school or wherever else that you first learned it. A lot of people just say the prayer in a mechanical way without even reflecting on the meanings of the words and what they're saying. We must all remember that Jesus gave a strong warning for us to continually beware of that danger of falling into you know, a dead, heartless, ritualistic way of serving him. None of us is immune. So it's a reminder once again, remember prayer is not a ritual. It's relational. We have to engage with God by his spirit and then pray. So it's not just a case of I have this ritual that I repeat every morning. 
Now, when Jesus says, don't use vain repetition, he's not saying, don't be persistent in prayer. You know, I used to have a Bible teacher who used to say to us, you know, once he prayed about something, he wouldn't pray again. And if you try to ask him to pray again, he will say, why? Didn't God hear you last time, you know? So if you prayed once, he won't want you to visit it. For the next 20 years, don't visit the prayer again. But you know, that's a bit taking things to an extreme end because Jesus himself in the book of Luke, in Luke 11, uh, verses five to 10, he tells the parable about the friend who goes knocking on his neighbor's door and asking for bread at midnight. And he says that because he was persistent, he was demonstrating importunity. That, that's the reason why he actually got that bread. His request was answered. And in Luke 18, verse one, he says, men ought always to pray and not faint. So, and he gives the account of the widow woman who keeps going back to the judge over and over and saying, judge, avenge me of my enemy. And the judge ignores her and she goes back, judge, avenge me of my enemy. The judge ignores me, she goes back until the judge says, this woman's gonna wear me out with her persistent request and he gives her what she wants. And Jesus compares God the father to the judge, even though that judge was an unrighteous judge, God is a righteous judge. Jesus said, how much more will our father in heaven, you know, answer us if we come in that way, in a persistent way. So it's not wrong for us to be persistent. It's wrong to give up. It's wrong not to allow faith to build up, to carry on and trust God for a positive outcome. Now, if this scripture is saying your father already knows the things you need, if God already knows what we need, then why should we pray? What are we praying for? If he already knows what we need, some people will say, I don't need to pray about it. God knows it already. But you know, we do need to pray because number one, our prayer expresses our total dependence on our heavenly father. God doesn't need the information, but he wants us to give him the information because even as we accept that we need that help, there's a level of uh, humility. A level of humility comes in when we accept that actually we can't do this. We need God every single day. We are not equal to the task of sorting out our own lives. We need God every day to help us. So God wants us to come and tell him. He knows what we need before we ask. So that means when we pray, we don't need to try and manipulate God. We don't need to try and come up with some impressive phrases or, you know, continue going on and on. Rather, it's just come, pour out your heart to him and cling to him in that faithful dependence because we can't manipulate God. You know, some people say, oh, let me quickly fast. And they think when they fast that God's going to answer the prayer. Not necessarily. We can't manipulate him. Go according to how the spirit is leading you and be genuine. God himself is honored when we are persistent in prayer. Just like that parable in Luke 18 tells us from verses 7 to 8. Prayer is the very avenue that God has appointed for our needs to be met. You know, God expects us to come and tell him what we're expecting from him. You know, we can't be like, oh, ah, well, um, since they say God knows, I don't need to pray. He already knows what am I telling him for. And because he knows he's just going to do it anyway. That's not how it goes. You know, in James 4, the Bible tells us that the reason our prayers are not being answered is because we are asking with the wrong motive. That if we're asking with the right motive, the answer will come. And then in James 5, it also tells us, you know, when you read James 5 from verse 13, he says, you know, is there anyone among you afflicted? Is anyone, you know, suffering? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Is anyone rejoicing? He should praise. Praise is a type of prayer as well. And he says, is anyone among you sick? Call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over you, anointing you with the oil in the name of Jesus, you know, in the Lord's name. And that prayer of faith will save the person who's sick and the Lord will restore him. So that tells us that we need to pray because the Bible is clear that when we pray, something will happen. And in James 5, verse 17, it goes on to tell us about Elijah, that Elijah 
a human like us. Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. And when he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, that's what happened, you know. He did not permit the rain to come in the place of prayer. He did it. Three years and six months, no rain because of the prayer of Elijah. And then when the showdown had happened on Mount Camel, he went back again and he prayed and the heavens were opened. And we even see that before the heavens opened, Elijah prayed like seven times intensely before they saw that cloud that was as small as the feast of a man rising up. And then he knew that the rain was coming. Imagine if it's some of us after praying seven times and then seeing the small fist, we will say, no, that small fist, that's not a, a, um, a rain cloud. Nothing's happening and we'll give up. Some people would have given up the first time, the second time, the third time. But Elijah repeated the prayer seven times and the rain came. So prayer is God's appointed way of meeting our needs. We ought to pray. When we say our father in heaven, you know, our father is a term of endearment. Abba. Abba, you know, emphasizes that relationship that we have with almighty God. Jesus called God Abba, which loosely translated might be daddy, but it's not exactly the same. But, you know, that expression that a young child calls their dad with, the dad that they trust, you know, the dad they have faith in, they believe in. That was the terminology Jesus uses to talk about God the Father. And nobody in history had ever spoken about God like that before Christ Jesus called him Abba. And you know what? When Jesus gave the disciples this template for prayer in Matthew 6, what he was saying is that privilege that I have, that relationship that I have, with God the Father, you too have been given access to that privilege. You too can call God Abba. You can call him Daddy and have that close, cononia, intimate relationship with him. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, according to Romans 8, 14 to 15, that we have not received a spirit of slavery that leads to fear again, but we've right. received a spirit of adoption as sons of God, the spirit by which we cry, Abba, Father. And we know when the Bible talks about sons of God, it's not talking about men. It's talking about everybody. And the Bible tells us again in Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So imagine God is your daddy. If we fully understand this, a lot of uh, people on planet Earth didn't have very good fathers. And because they didn't have good earthly fathers, they find it difficult to, to even imagine who God is as Abba. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to help us, to help us understand the heart of Abba. If you understood how much the father loves you, then you would pray even more and you would spend more time with him. Your prayer would not be a tick box activity or a ritual or something to please people. It would be about that thing that, you know, I'm going to my daddy. I'm, I'm having um, some private time with my daddy, with my Abba who loves me and who is the supreme authority in the universe. And we're praying to the father by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. So the whole Godhead is involved in our prayers. Holy Spirit prompts us to pray. He initiates our prayers, wakes you up at night, puts that prayer point inside of you. Father is the one we're addressing our prayers to. And our prayers ascend into the presence of Father through the intercession of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his priesthood. So always in the place of prayer, we are drawing near to God through the intercession of Jesus and also the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Going further, in verses 14 and 15 of Matthew 6, the Lord Jesus then teaches about forgiveness. 
as part of this prayer, this model prayer. It says, for if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, giving up resentment, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, letting them go, leaving them, giving up resentment, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So every day as a child of God, we need to pray the prayer of asking for mercy, but also we need to release other people. Whoever is indebted to us, maybe because they've sinned against us, um, they've said something about us, they've done something, we need to let them go. Jesus spoke to the disciples in John 13, 10 and said, anyone who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is clean all over. And you, my disciples, are clean. So what was Jesus meaning? Once we come to, to trust in Jesus, we know that we are cleansed of our sin. We are washed all over. However, as we walk about every day in our walk, in our day-to-day -day existence, our feet are going to get dirty. There are gonna be some places where we will fail. There'll be some things where we offend. There'll be a lot of errors we might do because perfection has not yet arrived. We're a work in progress. Our total 100% sanctification is not yet done. We are in progress. So daily we need our feet to be washed from those errors and those failures. And if we need our feet washing, our brothers and sisters need their feet washing too. We must not expect our prayers for forgiveness to be heard if we pray with malice and spite in our hearts towards others. Because if we pray like that without forgiving and releasing other people, then our prayer is a prayer of hypocrisy. We can't expect an answer. We can't sweep our sin under the rug, but we have to put it under the blood of Jesus. Every day, we must do this. In Proverbs 28, 13, the Bible warns that he who conceals, who covers up, who intentionally, willfully hides and keeps his sin a secret will not prosper. But if we confess, if we acknowledge our sins to God, we forsake them, we agree with God that what we have done is wrong, because when we are confessing our sin, we're agreeing with God. We're saying, God, you are holy, you are righteous, and I have failed. I've come short of your glory. I've not behaved the way I ought to have behaved. I'm agreeing with you, Lord, and I'm asking for your mercy. So if we do that, we will prosper. We will find the mercy of God. But if we try and hide our sins, it won't work. When you think about that word forgiveness, what does it mean? You know, it means that we are putting aside, we are laying aside whatever obligation we think the other person owes us because of the sin we feel they've sinned against us. So sometimes we say things like, oh, she owes me an apology. He owes me an apology. But whatever we think they owe us, we're letting it go. We are releasing them from the guilt or the penalty of that offense. You know, just as if they owed us money, if they owed you hundred pounds. You're saying, I'm letting go of that debt of a hundred pounds. I'm letting it go. And you know, they might not have apologized. That's not the point. The point is every day we need our feet to be washed. So even if they have not apologized, we are letting it go. We are not saying they owe us anymore. We let it go. We put the offense away. It's like they were in the prison that had been created by their sin, by their failure. And we are coming in and saying, I'm letting you out of this prison. You don't have to stay in this prison forever. You don't have to remain there. I'm letting you out. Just like Jesus is um, our scapegoat, really. He's the one who has made atonement for our sin. He's taken those sins away, never to bring them back again. We should be the same. We should allow whatever sinning other people have sinned against us, we should allow God to take it away and stop contending with them. When we say forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, we are asking God to forgive us according to the same standard that we have used in forgiving the sins of others. So we set the standard and God acts. 
So when I'm praying this prayer, I'm saying, God, deal with me like how I am dealing with other people. If I am refusing to forgive other people, I'm saying, God, deal with me in the same way. If I'm not showing grace to other people, if I'm hard on other people, if I'm difficult when it comes to letting go of the offenses of other people, I'm saying, God, use the same standard on me. If I refuse to forgive them, I'm saying, God, you also don't forgive me. So when we refuse to forgive others and then ask God for forgiveness, it's like a spiritual schizophrenia, you know, a split mind. You're asking God to give you what you are unwilling to give to someone else. And you can't have it both ways. Do you want to be forgiven? Then you must forgive others. I can't say, look, you know, I'm angry with my neighbor. Uh, she, 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 she messed up my bins the other day. She, she, my bins were, were, were not taken by the council because my neighbor added things on and she messed up my bins and, and I, I'm going to report it to the council. I wanted to suffer. I want this and the other. And then meanwhile, I'm saying, God, the failure that I failed, please, Lord, show me your mercy. Treat me with mercy. Look beyond my sin. And I'm refusing to look beyond the sin of my neighbor. So when you look at it, our real problem is not really a theological problem. It's a personal issue. The problem is most times when we refuse to forgive people, we are acting, we are being self-righteous. It's because we don't see ourselves as very great sinners. We think, you know what? I'm not so bad. I'm a good man. I'm a good woman. We don't appreciate how much God has forgiven us. We don't appreciate how big our sins are or were. We don't get how much of a sinner we are. So when others sin against us, we make a huge deal out of it. Their sin looks big because we think, oh, I'd never do that. You know, it's not like me. I'd never do such a thing. How dare they? How dare she? But the truth is all of us are very desperately wicked sinners without the blood of Jesus. And if we could see the depths of our own sin before God, the sins of other people, will look small. We won't be bothered about them when we think that my sin cost God's son his life on the cross. You know, some people will, will, will joke in pidgin English and say, you know, now me kill Jesus. Is it me who killed Jesus? Actually, yes, it's you who killed Jesus. It's me who killed Jesus. We killed Jesus. It was our sins that put him on the cross. And if you think you're not much of a sinner, you will carry on being self-righteous. You'll carry on being angry with people, gossiping about them. But if you understand that all of us are sinners and that your sins are not less than the sins of other people, your brothers and sisters in Christ, then you will forgive quickly. So as we round up tonight, I just uh, want us to think about how will we know we've forgiven them? How will we know that spark of wanting revenge has gone out? We will know we've forgiven them when we face what they did and forgive them anyway. And like I said, they might not have apologized. When we stop bringing it up to them, we stop reminding them, oh, sister, such and such, remember what you did to me in 1972 when we were in Seattle? Auntie Grace, do you remember what you did to me in 1990? You stop bringing it up. You don't talk about it to others. Oh, beloved, you're never going to guess what pastor's wife did to me. Oh, that woman is awful. She's a Jezebel. Oh, do you know what he did to me? Oh, he calls himself a Christian and he did this. We'll stop doing that. We'll show mercy instead of judgment. We'll stop wishing that God will punish them. Oh, God will punish you. We will refuse to speak evil of them. So when their names are brought up, you will not quickly answer with speaking evil. You will choose not to dwell on it. You will pray for them. You will ask God to bless them. You will not rejoice in their calamities. You'll not be like, hmm, serves them right. They thought they could get away with all that nonsense. They've been doing all that evil. Yes, haha. <laughs> today God caught them out in their treachery. We won't rejoice at other people's calamities and we will help them when we can because we've forgiven them. So forgiveness is a huge thing for us in the body of Christ to be able to put our hands together 
with the brothers and sisters in Christ that we feel have offended us or whoever, even if they're not believers, forgiving people from the depth of our hearts, understanding that we ourselves have been the recipients of God's mercy and we have no right to hold out against anybody else. So forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. Don't be like, I don't feel like forgiving. Well, your feelings are irrelevant. It's about an act of your will. Do you want to forgive? It's a choice. It's a choice that is based on the truth of God's word, that God is forgiven us, so we are forgiving others. It's not based on what is fair. So some people say, oh, that's not fair. It's not fair what they got. They're getting away with it. It's not about fairness. It's about the word of God, the justice of God. It's about a supernatural thing. It's not natural because it's spirit empowered. It's not like, you know what? I'm just going to grit my teeth and do it. It's not your self-effort. It's about the spirit of God empowering you. Forgiveness is unconditional. We can't say I'll forgive you when you've made restitution. I'll forgive you when you pay me back my money. I'll forgive you when you stop being the way you are. I'll forgive you when you change your personality. It's unconditional. And it's coming from a new heart that God has given us. It's not just from our lips. It must be coming from our hearts. And usually it's a process. It's not a one-time event. Most times we have to come back to God and say, Spirit of God, help me. Help me. I can still feel the, the resentment. Um, when I saw Sister Soren, saw my heart skipped, I could just feel this thing rising up in me. Lord, help me. Empower my forgiveness. And we've got to be holistic. You've got to cancel the whole debt. You can't say, I forgive you for what you did in 1990, but what you did in 2022, I'm not forgiving that. It has to be holistic. It can't be partial. And it's not about suppressing your anger and going, mm, just let them uh, for now, but I'll catch them someday. It can't be like that. You know, you acknowledge the debt owed to you, but you let it go. And God has commanded it for us as a lifestyle, meaning it's not occasional. You're not just going to forgive once in a blue moon. It's a lifestyle. Every day you might need to forgive. And the biggest thing with forgiveness is that it allows God to execute his justice in his time and in his own way. Beloved, honestly, sincerely, nobody gets away with anything in the kingdom of heaven. God has his own way of correcting people, of bringing them back to the place of understanding what they've done. Nobody circumvents God's justice. When we think we're going to punish them ourselves, stop talking to them or whatever ghosts them we are actually stopping god from doing what he knows will be the best thing to do and our interventions are never good anyway they never lead to any change they never have any impact but if we stand aside and let god have his way god will execute his justice so we are letting the the guilty person that is offended us. we're letting them off from our hook but god's hook is, is going to get them do you know sometimes people will be like or you're letting them off the hook. But no, you're not. When you're forgiving, you are saying, I'm not God. I'm letting these people off my hook so that they can go on God's hook because God knows what to do with them. And I don't stand there watching to see, oh, has God punished them? Has God punished them? No, let it go. You acknowledge unjust behavior is inexcusable, but you still forgive. You don't excuse the bad behavior. You don't be like, oh, well, whatever. You acknowledge that this behavior is not right, but you still forgive. And you resolve the anger, the resentment by releasing the offense and the offender. And it's an act of your will. I often pray to God and say, Lord, by an act of my will, I choose to let so-and-so go. I let them go. I release them from my heart. I release them from the prison of my self-righteousness. I release them, Lord. I let it go. And I ask Jesus and I say, Jesus, I ask that you would empower this forgiveness. Holy Spirit, help me empower this act of my will. Lord, I come and I lay my will down. You might feel hurt, but you are releasing the hurt and you're saying, Lord, wherever I've been wounded, wherever I've been bruised, I'm asking you to come in and heal that hurt. You're not trying to forget what they did, but you are letting it go. Because if you try and forget, you just sweep it under the carpet. So tonight, as we finish this section, um, I'm going to have to complete this chapter next week. I can't finish everything that I uh, planned for today. But as we close tonight, 
we need to ask ourselves these questions. Am I up to date on my forgiving? Or have you got some journal entries that you've recorded in your book of self-righteousness that you need to let go? Am I holding a grudge against anyone? Am I bitter against any person? Am I talking too much about what others have done to me? Have I forgiven those people who are even closest to me, who have hurt me so deeply? Have I let them go? And whatever our answers tonight, may the Holy Spirit help us and lead us in the right direction. So I'm gonna stop here tonight and ask if anyone has any questions or contributions.